So here is my first slide, which I've been seeing for the first time, so that's all good. Uh, Biochondriate Chemistry is a journal I started, uh, first issue at the beginning of 1990, uh, because someone in the ACS hierarchy felt that science of this kind needed a home within the ACS, it was getting lost, um, and that it really was chemistry. Um, I've been here a long time. Uh, I do chemistry of this kind, and this sort of previews uh, what bioconjugate chemistry is. We have a protein uh, in this blue and yellow surface. Bound to it is a synthetic organic molecule uh, and we're about to have a covalent bond formed between this double bond and this SH group on the protein to make a bioconjugate. Um, and believe it or not, that's important. Um, the journal has been around a while. It's got good impact factor, good citations. In spite of its rather specialized field, uh, it serves that field well. Uh, to make a long story short, it's about putting two functions together, and often one of those functions is a large molecule, and here are just some keywords in the kind of thing that uh, we feature every month in the journal. Uh, one of those down here at the bottom is the reason the journal was started in the first place, lo those many years ago, and now we see uh, certain biotech companies moving their antibody drug conjugates into phase three trials and on through the FDA. And so it's, it's coming back. When we started the journal, I thought, uh, well, this is crazy. They're never going to make drugs out of this. But I was wrong. And I guess I'm lucky I was. So I've been asked to address some, some issues that we all face as authors. <coughs> And the first one is, how do you decide whether you want to submit a letter, also known as a communication, or an article? Uh, you just got into something, you've got a result, you know that before it's really complete, you're going to have to do a lot more experiments. Is this the time? Do you have a result that's ready uh, to submit as a short communication instead of waiting for the full article. And so here are some questions that uh, we need answers to. What's the difference between a letter and an article? The letter is short and sweet. It has to be self-contained and it has to get attention. Uh, an article, of course, is long and detailed with lots of experiments and lots of data. A letter should be a game changer. When somebody in a related lab reads your letter or communication, it should change their plans a little bit about what they're doing. Uh, an article, on the other hand, is a journey. It's, well, we started with this big idea and we did 150 experiments and here they are in tables and here's the intermediate results and here's the final results. So they're, they're really quite different publications. Uh, why should you consider submitting a letter rather than a full article? Uh, in some ways, it's easier to, to write in the first place, so there's this practical issue. But journals handle them more rapidly. We often have uh, fast reviewers that we send manuscripts uh, for letters to. And readers generally pay more attention to a letter. They think, well, the journal has set this thing off in its own section, and it's supposed to be important and groundbreaking, and so I want to see that. What are the biggest challenges to writing a letter? Well, they're short, and in some ways it should be easy to write them, but you have to tell the whole story and what's going to end up is two to four printed pages. And different journals have different criteria for the length limit on a letter or communication. And some do it in terms of the number of characters, some in terms of the number of words, some in terms of the number of printed pages. 
uh, they all end up in this range, two to four pages, generally uh, trending toward four pages as time goes on. And a big challenge is decide what to leave out of your manuscript if you're going to write a manuscript for a letter. You can't tell them everything you know because there isn't enough room. You've got to get down to a nicely shaped story. What are the most common reasons that letters are rejected? Uh, in my exper experience, the number one reason is it's premature. Somebody has begun a project, they've got a result, the result might mean everything's wonderful, it might mean nothing at all, and there just aren't enough data yet to uh, say anything very definite about the significance of the result. And so most of them bounce for that reason. You're just coming in too early, it's short enough and all that, but there's not enough in, in it. The results don't justify the claims. Uh, secondary to that, sometimes you say, well, it's just not very exciting. You need to make it be a note or expand it into a full article. But more often, in, in my experience, somebody comes in with something that maybe the person next to them on the lab bench is excited about, but probably the person down the hall would just say, huh, and, and that's not going to make it. How do you deal with figures and data when you're writing a letter? Well, you've got to keep it simple. You've got to be very selective and very careful in your graphics. Uh, you can't have figure legends or labels on the axes that only people within your laboratory understand. You have to have words that will immediately mean something to the reader. And something that happens more and more is you use supporting information uh, for things that you just can't fit into the letter. So what is supporting information? Material that the reader doesn't really need to read the paper, but they do need to see in order to be sure that you did everything you should have to prove your point. Uh, it is published on the web. Uh, virtually all journals do this as a separate document and virtually all journals make supporting information available for free. They're trying to encourage authors to put routine data in supporting information, the stuff that has to be there, but isn't really part of the exciting story. For ACS publications, uh, supporting information is available at that website. Uh, if you want a more tight link between an article and supporting information. You go to the journal web page, you get the article on the web page, and there's a link right there for the supporting information. If you go here, you're going to have to do that all over again, and it's not quite as user friendly. <coughs> and finally, just a, a little key for people who are writing their first paper or submitting it to an ACS journal. You don't put the figures and tables in the supporting information if they're meant to be in the article. Some journals have these systems where you have the text as one file and figure one as another file and figure two as another file and all that sort of thing. Don't do that for ACS. You, you submit one file that has text, figures, tables, etc. Everything that's going to be in the finished article. So I just had to throw that in because we see that and it delays everything. Another thing I've been asked to comment on is what are common mistakes of new authors? And editors, of course, see a lot of manuscripts from new authors. And we like new authors. Uh, we don't have any animus about this, uh, but we have seen every mistake you can make, almost, and so there, there are certain things that I'll just share with you that you probably shouldn't do. First of all, if you're not familiar with the journal, but you send a manuscript anyway, you look at the impact factor and you say, hey, that looks good, I'll send my manuscript there. Um, well, no. Uh, if Maybe you'll get lucky and it'll be 
compatible, but too many times it isn't. It's not written in the same depth as the manuscripts published in the journal. Uh, journals have a style, which is, of course, a bit broad, but it doesn't, just doesn't fit with the readership of the journal. And you've wasted some time there if you do that. Uh, another sort of technical error is that the manuscript format that you submit doesn't fit the journal's requirements. The, the author guidelines are very explicit in what a manuscript needs to have in it and how the references should be formatted and so on. And journals have people, before the editor even sees it, who look at the manuscript for items of style and bounce it back to the author with this uh, dreaded word unsubmit uh, if there's something wrong with the format. The reviewers, for example, like to see titles of all the references because instead of just Smith and Jones 1985, they see Smith and Jones, the curing of cancer by way of my interesting new bioconjugate 1985. And so you got to have the format right and you only waste your time if, if you don't. Uh, again, uh, premature manuscripts. See these, an author gets excited, sends you the manuscript. It's, it's a great idea, but it's just not there yet, and so it's not ready to be published. Um, another is duplication of prior work. If, if you just you did the methyl derivative and now you've done the ethyl derivative, that's not a new publication. Um, failure to properly cite literature precedents. The authors have the major responsibility to cite the relevant literature. And if everybody knows that Smith and Jones did the seminal paper in this field, and I see a manuscript and I'm reading along and about reference 15 down there in the materials and methods, they say, well, we did this according to reference 15 and that's Smith and Jones and the introduction had nothing about them. It didn't say Smith and Jones started this field and I'm following along, which is okay. It's, it's not anything to be ashamed of if you've done good work. Uh, it's the author's responsibility to properly cite literature precedents. Uh, another issue is a little too much uh, data in the experimental section that's not really necessary uh, except as reference material, put that in the supporting information. Uh, inadequate characterization of products. Any chemistry journal that deals with new compositions of matter, uh, and any ACS journal in particular, has a high standard for characterization. And as you might imagine, bioconjugates that have proteins and nucleic acids and synthetic molecules and lipids and heaven knows what else in there, have some real challenges in characterizing products. But by the same token, there are modern methods that really are remarkable at what they can do to help you characterize products, and you can't ignore them. Uh, I'll emphasize something that Jim said, the language you should think of the reader. When, when you are ready to submit a manuscript, another pair of eyes needs to see it because there just may be a few little glitches in there that you could fix before it was submitted and make the reviewers happy and everyone else. And finally, something that happens every now and then, we ask for suggestions of reviewers. And, and it's very interesting to see what we get back uh, because sometimes the author uh, nominates their three best friends from graduate school as reviewers, and, and we can tell that. You know, we see a lot of these things. Uh, sometimes the author nominates the last Nobel laureate in chemistry as a reviewer, and when, when you send it to that person, they often just say, no, this is crap. You know, I got a Nobel Prize doing this, and this is not a Nobel Prize, so why are you bothering me? Uh, so think about reviewers that are knowledgeable and are not members of your immediate family uh, and are, are likely to, to give a, a reasonable, balanced review. And peer review, we, we've mentioned it a couple of times, peer review is certainly not perfect. Uh, 
that paper in Science by arsenic bacteria from NASA is a nice example of peer review not being perfect. Uh, but editors really can't know everything, and another pair of eyes, or two or three more pairs of eyes, really help in defining what's valuable about a manuscript and where perhaps improvements could be made. And so I like peer review. I'm not, uh, you know, deceived by its imperfections, but we're going to be using it for a while. As Jim has pointed out very nicely, ACS journals are widely read and used by scientists everywhere. So the author has a responsibility. Don't put misinformation out into a respectable public domain where it could be misused. Uh, and another thing about peer review is you should think of it as a community service. If you publish in a journal, you should be willing to review for that journal. If three people reviewed your manuscript, you, in a sense, owe the journal reviews of three manuscripts. And I know it's difficult to get your head around that, but uh, it's, it's a valid point of view. And then finally, what's the best way to handle reviewer feedback? Well, remain calm, because often it's not complimentary. Or if it's complimentary, there's a little sort of pro forma, oh, this is a very interesting extension of such and so. And then, you know, the bullets start flying after that. Uh, <coughs> the reviewer is almost always right. They're not always right, certainly not. And down here somewhere, if the reviewer makes an error, uh, you can challenge them, but be collegial about it. No cuss words, uh, no characterizations of IQ level or anything like that. Uh, it, it doesn't help, you know. I've, I've seen those. I've seen all manner of responses to, to reviews over the years. And it's, it's better to just be, well, the reviewer may not be aware of this paper which was published five years ago, which totally uh, settles this matter. And therefore, we felt it wasn't necessary for us to go into it, things like that. Uh, remember, papers are going to be read. It's not just another item on your publication list. There are people out there in the world that are going to read it. And if it's no good, they're going to respond accordingly. So you have a, a responsibility. And of course, you have to provide strong scientific evidence for what you say. Uh, you're going to write a response letter. Most uh, we almost never accept a manuscript without revision. So virtually every manuscript gets revised at least once and sometimes multiple times. Uh, in your response letter, deal with every reviewer's comment. Just because the editor and the, the reviewers, it's going to probably go back to the reviewers if there's serious issues, they're going to want a little pricey of what you've done. And make the changes, don't just make the changes in your response letter. Remember to make them in the manuscript as well. If somebody says, what temperature did you do that at? And your letter says, we did it at 80 degrees, but your manuscript didn't change. You haven't really fixed the problem. Uh, and you can certainly, you don't have to do everything the reviewer says you have to do, but you have to explain why you didn't. Uh, if the editor uses that word, and, and we all shudder when we see that word, I try not to use it, uh, then believe it, you, you have the choice, you can appeal the editor's decision and wait two or three months to have the editor's decision reaffirmed, uh, or you can reformat it and send it to another journal. And it, it's up to you. Sometimes appeals work but it's way less than 50%. Uh, and you should always revise the manuscript because those reviewers, they're intelligent, knowledgeable people. They may hate you, but they're intelligent, knowledgeable people and a lot of what they say is probably correct and you should revise your manuscript accordingly. And remember, you have to make all the revisions and our modern 
American Chemical Society, we no longer have uh, copy editors who, if, if you scribble something on a manuscript page and fax it in, they're not going to rekey it. No, no, no. Uh, and if you email it to the editor, no, no, no. You have to go through the web. It's the only thing that works. And you have to make all the revisions and make it perfect before you put it on the web. And there we are. It's time for me to stop. <laughs>